Yeah, you, some of you may know me already from last year. Um, my name is Ben Biesbelle Nueng. I'm from Denmark, so if you think I sound a bit strange, that might be the reason. Sugel um, Kule. <laughs> now, um, last year's talk was about how to create a drum kit, record your own drum kit, and then use our editor to create a drum gizmo sample set from that. Um, but we get a lot of questions from non drummers who has an existing sample set from somewhere on the internet. And they ask, can we use this with drum gizmo? And so far, the answer to that has been no, you cannot. Um, but recent developments has actually made this possible. So hence the title, how to make a drum kit with an existing sample set. So that's um, what I'll be boring you with for the next hour <laughs> or so. Um, but first to recap, how many of you know what drum gizmo is? Okay, it's easier to ask who doesn't. Okay, a few, great. I thought I'd just introduce the project um, because um, even the guys of, even those of you who know what drum gizmo is might not actually know the full scope of what we are trying to achieve. Um, what we want to do is basically replace a drummer that's pretty silly because I'm a drummer and I'm trying to replace myself here. But, um, but the idea is to um, get what corresponds to a recording session with a drummer in a real studio um, using, for example, MIDI. Um, and only rudimentary MIDI, uh, and by rudimentary I mean just plotting in notes with constant velocity and no time shift or humanization or anything. And then the Drum Gizmo project will make this smooth and nice and realistic based on, well, just nothing, really. Um, we also want to be able to reuse all these well-known and tried techniques for mixing real drums, because people have been doing this in the studios for many years. Um, and you can see um, YouTube videos describing which plugins to use and how to, how to mix a snare drum and make it sound like this and that. And we want to be able to use those same techniques on the drum gizmo output um, then we also want to be able to record our own drum kits because there are existing proprietary solutions, um, none of which I use because none of them work on Linux. Um, so you can download um, VSTs, for example, and use their existing sample sets, which are hu huge and no, uh, realistic sounding and all this, but it is can be hard or even impossible to use your own drum kit or create your own samples. So we wanted an open file format for this. And then maybe the most important aspect, we wanted to be able everywhere, uh, available everywhere. Um, and what I exactly mean by this is we want it to be usable as a plugin, so you can use it in Ardor, Qtractor, whatever. Um, we want it to be cross-platform as well. So currently we support LV2 and VST. We have uh, AAX and audio unit on roadmap. Um, we are doing some work in this area. Um, we're not quite there yet. Um, you can use it as a jack client. So simply start it up, load a drum kit into it, and then you can connect all the outputs to which whichever application you want to. And uh, if you remember the talk from FoxyX yesterday, uh, you know now very well that that can be virtually anything. Um, you can connect it directly to the sound card. Um, this might not be especially, uh, that might not, not be directly useful to me, most users, but if you're, for example, using a live session on stage, you don't want to load up the door to hook up the drum kit to the door. You just want to hook up the drum kit direct to, directly to a Raspberry Pi, for example, stuff like this. Then you can do it directly <coughs> um, through any of the uh, existing audio drivers. Um, then we can do offline uh, standard MIDI file uh, rendering. So you just feed it a MIDI file and it will produce a WAV file. So you don't have to do anything live. This is just for, okay, I have this MIDI file, I want the drums for it. Give me it. Um, we have on the roadmap audio onset analy an analyzer. Um, and for this specific feature, which I'm very excited to to, to be able to start working on soon. Um, we'll be able to do drum replacement. So you can, if you have a recording and the snare drum sounds very bad, you can use Drum Gizmo to analyze where are the snare hits, how hard are they, and then transfer those into a sample set. 
to replace a badly sounding snare with a realistic, good sounding snare. And a ton of other stuff. Um, so you make something up, you ask us, and we add it. <laughs> That's how it works, right? <laughs> it's open source, hey. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so last year I presented some stuff. I also presented some, um, some status on the project, so I thought I'd just fill you in. What did we do since last year? Because actually we, we made um, two releases and then a hotfix release. So actually two pretty big releases. First of all, and that's maybe the most dominant feature, we actually have the OSX support now, um, both with VST and LLV2. The downside to this currently in this state is that we do not support binaries. So we cannot create packages, DMG files, or whatever it's called, because none of us are OSX developers. Um, but as you can see here, it actually works. This is Reaver running on OSX. You can compile this yourself if you're able to. And if, if anybody here at the audience or on the internet or anywhere else is able to help us out in this area, we would very much like that because it would be cool to be able to supply a DMG files for people to just download and use. But we're not just there yet. We entered, um, added a, um, a feature called Direct Choke. Um, the old version of Drum Gizmo had something called uh, instrument groups. So you can have the hi-hat group, for example. So if you play one sample in the hi-hat group, and then another one in the same group, it would stop the existing one. So you have an open hi-hat playing, and then you have a foot hi-hat sample. That would choke the open hi-hat stroke. So you can have an open close hi-hat working like this. But that would work in both directions and for all instruments in the group. Um, and for example, if you have two open hi-hats, hi semi-open and fully open, those would also choke each other, which was not what we wanted. So therefore we added directed choke, in which you can actually say, okay, I want the hi-hat foot to choke these individual other samples, and not the other way around. So that gives, a more, um, gives more control to, to the pe uh, people when designing the drum kits. Um, then Andre added an improved sample selection algorithm, because what we had for the uh, sample randomization had some downsides. Um, specifically, if we had a sample set where a lot of samples were clustered um, around the same power levels, so if you have um, many hits with the same hardness, or how you say that, I don't know. Yeah, not velocity, because velocity is something coming into the system. The, the hardness, how much physical power was put into actually hitting the drum. If you have many bits, hits within that same range, um, that wouldn't work very well. Some of these samples would never be played. Uh, all those might be played all the time. So this new sample selection algorithm makes sure that the amount of times a single sample is being played is, is better represented as a whole. Uh, and that gives a much better uh, listening experience. Um, we all ha also have some better controls for how to make this sample selection algorithm work. Um, so before you could just, it was just there. Now you have to have three knobs to pull in. Um, they can be a bit hard to understand exactly what is going on be behind those knobs. Um, but we tried to, to describe it as good as we could. Um, and finally, a lot of users have uh, been asking if we could have drum gizmo support round robin samples. Um, and just to explain what round robin samples is, it's a very dumb version of sample selection where you have, for example, three samples in a group, one, two, three. And round robin is simply playing one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Each time you need a new one, you just take the next in the series. Um, so really, we didn't want to add this feature because it doesn't make sense. It sounds you can hear loops and you can hear patterns if you play um, sequential notes. Um, but this new sample selection algorithm, you can actually put the settings in a specific way that makes it behave like this. So even though we didn't want to add this feature, we sort of got it from the side. Um, we also added MIDI aftertouch events. This is specifically interesting for people with MIDI drum kits, physical MIDI drum kits, because you can hit a cymbal and you can choke it with a hand, you can catch it and it will stop the note playing, um, which should simulate this system. Um, a similar feature can be used for the hi-hat. If you just open the hi-hat and then you press a pedal, it can choke this, the, the sample. 
Um, we haven't tested this much because we don't have a physical drum kit, <laughs> but somebody who has a drum kit did a recording and we tried to use the, that as input for the feature. Um, another thing that's, which has been circling uh, for a while um, is uh, that people want to be able to see the drums and, and press them and hear them. Um, I think uh, Robin made this AV drum kit uh, solution for um, uh, what's he called? What are they called? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, AVL drums. Um, and we wanted to do something similar, so we actually did. And be aware that this is not directly available unless the drum kit you are loading actually supports it. And currently, none of the drum kits do so, <laughs> but they will soon. I hope. And this is not the final UI. No, 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 not really. Yeah. So you can click them, um, and all these shitty colors will probably change down the road as well, but at least now it's there. Um, there is, oh, okay, you can't see, of course, um, the number here at the button, bottom, you change that with a scroll wheel. So if you click afterwards, it will just use that. You're not supposed to play the drum kit like this. You're supposed to, to audition it. Okay, you just load the drum kit. I, I can, now I can see it. Now I want to hear the right symbol. And you don't have to find the note in the, in the piano roll or something. Um, can, is it possible to, the, the reverse, you play, you play a MIDI note and you see what, which drum it is? We just added that to the roadmap yesterday. Good. <laughs> so soon. <laughs> what? Yes, yes. Um, we also added some tool tips because uh, a lot of people have problems understanding exactly what all these knobs do. Um, and this is not not very very much helped by the fact that if I don't use the plugin myself for a few weeks and I come back to it, I can't remember what they do. So we added these two tips. Um, I think you can see. I'm sh I'll show you the, a bit later. Um, but basically, there's a question mark in all these boxes, and you can click them, and it will pop up a box saying, "Okay, this knob does this," and it responds like this. So you can actually get some help. Um, a feature which I'm quite happy with is that we also added now a, a drum kit validation tool because previously people were writing XML files and those are pretty big sometimes. And if you miss a slash somewhere or a quotation mark or whatever, that can be a bit tedious to find. And the, um, the engine simply says fail. So you have no idea what, what went wrong. But we made this drum kit validation tool so you can, from a command line, you can invoke it and ask is this drum kit actually sane? Do I refer WAV files that do not exist if I made a spelling mistake, for example, or is an instrument incomplete in some way? And this is very helpful. Um, for this feature, we also added some improved error reporting, which is used both by the um, drum kit validation tool, but also by the UI. So if you load a drum kit and it turns red, it actually prints why it is red. It didn't in previous versions. Um, and we added no sample normalization. Um, this was a bit of a peripheral feature, but um, for some reason, sometimes people have samples and they want to normalize them on disk. And then all samples are basically the same power, but to be able to reproduce those in the, um, in the door with the velocities, we then need to multiply the velocity as a power level, so they will be uh, lower volume at lower velocities. Um, so we added that as well. And we got dynamic MITNAM support, um, which is, I think I, I yeah, you can, you can see the notes in, in the timeline, which is pretty cool. And um, here I have a, a small anecdote, because last year, this is a small snippet from the talk, we assign MITNAM. Uh, to a plugin. The problem we have with LV2 all the time is that when you load up the plugin, it doesn't, you haven't loaded the drum kit yet. So it doesn't know anything about MIDNAM or output channels or anything. It has to assign those at startup. 
Um, but we've been working with Robin and, and David, for example, by figuring out, could we do something dynamic so we can assign, when you load the drum kit, it will dynamically assign the midnam that corresponds to that drum kit, generated from the drum kit file, because all the data is there. But it's not, it doesn't exist yet. And yeah, so this was exactly one year ago, but later that evening, <laughs> this guy, Ari Garius, who you probably all know, or should know if you don't, he popped into our RC channel, and he said, that was wrong, David, that's me. Um, and yes, he was absolutely right, I was wrong, I was thinking about poll groups. Well, then he posted this link, just fire this up in the command line. And what this does, if you're not technical, this is downloading a patch file from a website, from Linux Audio, and this command over here applies that patch to the code in the directory in which I'm, I'm standing. And that's how Drum Grisma got Bitnam support. <laughs> 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 so thank you, Robin. <laughs> So yes, we now have Midnam support, and it works very well. I use it all the time, and I cannot even begin to fathom what, how I have been managing without it. Um, so we should, of course, add this a lot, a lot earlier. But now to the actual topic of this talk, because I haven't even started on that yet. Um, because we now have um, sample normalization, uh, and because of this new sample selection algorithm, we can ac now actually meaningfully do something with existing sample sets. Um, this has been a hindrance up to now, so um, I will try to do this by by example, because a uh, drum kit that people are very often referring to is the Salamander drum kit. Um, and by the way, a quick note, if you s Google Salamander kit and not drum kit, um, you won't find anything about drum kits. Apparently, a salamander kit is something for raising salamanders in an aquarium. Um, <coughs> but you can download the sample sets here. It is available uh, in multiple places. This is one is from Linux Audio. Uh, it's not very big. I think 300 megabytes or something like this. Um, it, of course, contains many drums. Uh, but since there's quite a lot of work for integrating this or porting this into our own XML file format, um, I'll just focus on one. Uh, instrument in this talk, um, in this case, snare 2. Um, I'll show you shortly an example of the SFC format, uh, which describes this snare. But basically, it has four, we can call it velocity groups. I think it's called groups also in the SFC format. But they have um, what they're calling ghost sample set, which consists of 10 samples. Ghost notes, if for those of you who are not drummers, are those you, you if you have a hit, and then you sort of tap the snare softly. Dun, 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 dun. You can, that's a ghost note. So the ghost notes are the softest ones. And then we have um, MP, which I think might be mezzo piano, I don't know, something like this. And then forte, F, again, and this is 12. And forte fortissimo, which is eight notes. Um, and all these samples, like I said, are, are normalized. Um, so in our output here, we have to set normalized to true for this to work, but it does. Um, normalized means that the, 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 um, the sample is analyzed for the peak value, and then the peak value is being scaled to the full extent of what what the data type can contain. Um, in case of floating point, that will be up to the one max. Um, and in case of 16-bit uh, wave format, that will be 32,000. So um, all the samples have the same power level, or like not power level, but, but uh, audio level, um, which is not usable um, when reproducing the velocities. OK, was that clear? You can say that you extend the wave file to 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 get better headroom, but again, it wasn't rec if it wasn't recorded like this, you don't really gain anything from it. And especially if you're using floating point format, you have so much headroom already, then it doesn't really make sense. But there might be other technical reasons why some sample sets are normalized. I'm not familiar with those. Sorry, from from my understanding, that means that 
in, in drum gizmo, you record the, the loudness of the drum hit as it is, because you, you played it softly. Yes. And in, in for example, this uh, SFZ file, everything is made the same loudness and the, the sampler engine scales it down again. Yeah, you can say you hit it softly, record it, then you scale it up and store it in the file. And then in the SFC format, it tells it, okay, you should scale it back up to this level. Uh, so you scale it first up and then down again. Okay, and because that's the new value that you can handle normalized files. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, Thanks. so normalized in our case just means that it applies the velocity to the, pow to the, the audio level on the output side. But this also means that if you have a very very small sample set and you normalize everything, um, then you can actually get a better representation of many velocities with a few samples. Because the velocities are limited to the number of samples in the sample set otherwise. But here you can get 127 levels from just one sample. Yes, I think there's a question. Can we get the microphone? So I understand, for example, if you want to make a, a space-efficient drum kit, you don't want to uh, s include 32-bit floating-point wave files. You can use like 16-bit integer, integer, but with this normalization, you still get a high dynamic range and a low noise floor because even this, the, 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 the hits that are very quiet, they're gonna like be optimally using the whole dynamic range and you have no noise for them. I uh, guess. Yes, but the noise wouldn't necessarily be there in the first place. So, yeah, I don't never know. mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyways, enough, enough talk about normalization. Um, so we have these four sample groups, um, velocity groups, and we need somehow to map those. So that's roughly 40, 40, 50 files. We need to map those somehow into the drum gizmo system. In drum gizmo, all the samples simply have a power level. And this is used directly to map onto a power level line. Uh, and when an input velocity comes in, a new MIDI note, this velocity is translated into a power level. Um, so we need to represent those. So how do we do that? The trivial but virtually bad solution is to simply assign all the samples with the same power value, because that's what they have. They're all normalized. So we can just say, OK, all the samples from this drum kit, we assign power level 1, which means that the engine will select any of them with the same uh, probability, no matter what the input velocity of the media node is. But after that, it would apply the, uh, the velocity scaling because of the normalization feature. So we would, what you would hear would be a sound that would have the right volume based on the input velocity. But it would somehow, sometimes play a ghost note scaled up with a 127 hit. And that would probably not sound what you want to. So that would be a bit of a mess. So can we do something better? We can do something that's very simple. So simple that it is almost cheating. <laughs> we can assign power values from 1 and up in the integrals. We don't have to have power values between 0 and 1. We can do any range. They just need to be spaced, um, um, so their relative spacing is used internally, and not necessarily the actual value, actual value. So if we do this, then we would just have these lower 14 ghost notes. We'll have that, call them 1 to 14. And then the next group, the mezzo piano, would be 15 and upwards, and so on. So this would make the sorting right, and make the sample selection algorithm choose a sample in the right area. So the ghost notes will only be played, or rarely be played otherwise, but only in the lower velocity region, which would be what we wanted. Um, and again, the scaling would handle the rest, so we will have the output with the right power. Um, but in SFC, there is actually some um, information about how to spread these with respect to the probabilities and power values. So we can go for the full monthly solution, and we can actually look at those values and convert them into the drum gizmo powers. So if we assume that whoever made these SFC files knew the input powers of the actual strokes, it might just be guesswork. We don't know this, but the SFC file is there, and it seems to be working. So we can actually trans translate those 
into um, the, the corresponding values in the drum gizmo instruments. Um, and here's an extract from, from, um, from the SFC file. Um, these just go on and on. But what we see here is that, first of all, we have a key value. This is the input uh, node value, 38. Um, and then we see, uh, I'm too close to this. <coughs> Um, yeah, okay, we have ghost nodes here at the bottom, and they are at low level 1 to, low lev to high level 29. That means the input velocities of 1 to through 29 will be mapped to this group. And I've, I've cut out most of the values because they are basically the same. But um, then in this group, they are mapped from 0 to 1. Um, but if we translate those two values into what corresponds to the drum gizmo values, which are velocity levels between 0 and 1, and we then divide these equally, um, then we will get the, the, the span of this region and corresponding span for the other th three. Um, so that gives these. So the ghost notes 1 to 25 corresponds to this range in the drum gizmo area, which is from 0 to 1. It has 10 samples. That means we, we use this increment for each of the samples in this group. The other groups are spread a bit differently. Some have more samples. This has fewer, but this group is one, only 101 to 27, so that's a bit smaller also. So the increments are slightly different. Um, and a bit of math on that would work. Um, also, yeah, what I what I failed to say earlier, the salamander drum kit are stereo files. But as we can see here in um, in the file names, they're all called OH, which I uh, assume means overhead. So we can assume this is an overhead recording microphone pair. Um, and Drum Gizmo, as some of you know, uh, is using 16 channels, or if you're in the studio, that would resemble one snare microphone and one on the kit drum and one for each of the toms and overheads and ambient microphones and so on. And you want to emulate this, but we cannot do this with this sample set because they are, they are not there. What we can do, though, is we can simply make a drum kit with two channels, two overhead channels, and we can map the channels from the snare directly to those um, so here's what this um, drum gizmo drum kit file would look like, could look like. We have two drum kit channels, OH left and OH right. Um, and then we have the instrument section, and again, I'm only focusing on snare 2 here. Um, if we made all the instruments, they would just flow down here. And we make a channel map, so we say the snare OH channel would map to the drum kit OH channel. This is very trivial one-to-one -one mapping, but it works in this case. Um, the instrument, and here is all the math stuff, and it took me quite a while to do all the calculations, but what you see here is all the samples from uh, directly from the Salamander kit. Um, over here we have file channel, which means that this is the offset channel number inside the files, and since they are stereo, we have channel file channel 1 and file channel 2. Um, the, the real drum gizmo drum kit files are usually 16 channel wave files, so they'll just go from 1 to 16. If you have mono files in your sample set, you simply use different files here. In this case, this is the same file name with different channels. So you can mix and match this as much as you like. Um, as you can see, we have... Oh, there's an error here. There should be a D there. I did fix it in the right file, but not in the slideshow. Um, normalized two, and we do this on all the samples. And then we have the power level for this specific sample, and um, it increases. Um, I cut out all the in intermediate ones, but uh, yeah, but it increases. So we have, this is the lowest one, this resembles a velocity level one, and this is then the last of the ghost notes, and even though numbers look like each other, this is zero here. So this is increment 
10 times uh, yeah, 10 times this value, basically. And it just goes on um, up until the last one, which will have the power level of 1. And this spreading of the samples on the power line inside Drum Gizmo should correspond to the same one as we read it from the SFC file. Is this all clear, or is this just XML gibberish to you? I, f I find the lack of answer disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have a question. Uh, just, uh, just a quick question. So the resulting drum Gizmo kit will have uh, two channels? Yes. OK. With, with this setup, I'll come back to a different solution shortly. But this is just I have d made some decisions here. Some of them may not be what you want, but we can dive into some alternative solutions later. Um, the last point, one sorry. One uh, I, I think even if it's if it would be gibberish, there's a recording and we can look it up. And this is for people who want to make their own drums. So I think this is very useful to see for them. Yeah, and unfortunately, at this point, uh, we have no way of automating this. I'll say this is actually a very large step towards being able to convert FSC formats directly into drum gizmo. Um, so I think we'll be looking into that at some point. But for now, if you want to do your own sample sets, you have to use a text editor and and work with XML. Okay, so the last bit uh, we need is to do the channel map, uh, or sort of the MIDI map. Uh, and since we only have one instrument in this, um, just mapping the note 38 to the instrument name, which you saw here, and which needs to correspond to this name here. So in, in this file, we have a name, and it refers to an XML file which contains the instrument. And in the instrument, the name needs to be the same. Otherwise, the engine will complain. So now we just say we map node 38 to this instrument. And then we're done. Um, after this, we can now use this DG validator tool, the command line tool that I mentioned earlier, um, to actually verify that I didn't mess anything up. And this was very useful, because in this case, it did. Um, I, was, I was having a a um, uh, mixed, uh, a ma missing a slash somewhere, a mi missing end tag. But this simply says, OK, look in this file at line 8. You're missing something there. And I could very easily find it and fix it. Um, so I did, and I run it again. And now it says, finish without errors. And the return code on the command line will be a 0. Up here, it will be a 1. So if you want to automate this somehow, you can check the return value of the tool to to in the build system or whatever to, to find out if it failed or not. And now, demo time. Yay. And unfortunately, I have to close down everything because it's running Pulse Audio for my browser. Let's just see. So what I did here is um, I've added the drum kit, um, and I have loaded it, Salamander XML, and Salamander is containing the snare alone, so nothing but the snare. Um, and then I loaded the MIDI map. For this purpose uh, of demonstration, I disable all the humanization, because that will alter the velocities because that's basically what Drum Gizmo is good at. But right now, I want to actually show you exactly what, what it does. Um, so I've made four groups of notes. Um, the first group has velocity of 16, the second of 60, the third of 100, and the last one of 127. So this, will, this should fall into the three group areas, so to speak. This is not, this is not strictly groups. That, like that would be in the SFC format, because even though we are here uh, playing a note at a very low velocity, because of the sample selection algorithm, it actually allows to select samples outside this region, but with a lower probability to, m to make it less machine gunny. 
but let's give it a hear. Do we have sound? Yes? Again? So this, this is the output, and we have stereo output only, as you might see um, in these two uh, top channels here. So those are the, the OH uh, channels. The remaining ones are just empty, because the Drum Gizmo plugin always has 16 outputs. It just uses only those um, acquired by the drum kit. So I'll just close this down again. On this, you want to see anything else before I close it? No? Okay, so we made some decisions here. Um, the first decision which we could do differently is to, instead of just printedly mapping the OH channel to the corresponding two OH channels in the, in the drum kit, we could use some groupings because that will give us a bit more control. So if we, when we later on, now we just have the snare, so that's kind of trivial, but we could add kicks and toms and cymbals and so on. And then we could do a stereo pairs of output channels on the drum kit. And then we could have, let's say, OH kick, uh, right and left, OH snare, right and left, OH toms, right and left, and cymbals, right and left. And then we could map all the kick instruments to the OH kicks, the snares to the snares, toms to the toms, and cymbals to the cymbals. That would give us a bit more control, because then we can actually uh, turn up and down the volume of each instrument individually. Uh, what we wouldn't be getting would be all the bleeding, which is what makes drum gizmo samples, the, 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 uh, the real drum kits, uh, sound natural. But in this case, it might still be a good trade-off if, if you really want to use uh, this custom, um, custom sample set. Um, we could also imagine that we have um, uh, some, some samples that are caught up already but do not have normalized values, like we do in, in this Salamander kit. Um, if we have the sorting provided somehow in the file names or anything like this, we could simply add them with increasing powers, like I, I told you about earlier, simply giving them integral values from one and up, and then the engine should act more or less like you want to. Um, um, but if there is no sorting available, you just have a bunch of samples and you have no idea what their power values are, you could actually actively normalize them individually, add them with the same value, so power level one to everything, and then add normalization, and you will, might get some, something what you, like what you want. Um, but if there are, um, but if there are like, like the, um, uh, the ghost notes and such uh, in the Salamander kit, you might get some weird results, but you can probably validate this by simply playing them and figuring out where should I put these uh, ordering-wise. Uh, be aware that if you have mono files <coughs> in a sample set and you decide to normalize them, you cannot simply normalize each individual sample because they are connected as a pair. Um, and the speci speci specifically, you need to figure out exactly which channel should be the master channel which defines how much it should be turned up in the gain, in the normalization. Um, if you have a, let's say, four, four microphones used to capture a snare drum, uh, you would have one microphone on the snare, one on the kick drum, and two overhead microphones, for example. On the snare, you would want to analyze based on the snare microphone, because that would be the master channel for the snare. And based on that value, you would turn up all the samples all four samples with the same amount. If you do not do this, simply normalize them individually. Uh, when 
playing different samples, it would sound like the snare would be moving around because it would be louder in the left channel and then louder in the right channel sometimes. Yes, question. What I don't get is why, why would you normalize individually? I mean, you can understand if you have a sample, uh, uh, like a drum kit that already exists and is normalized, uh, of course you have to work with it. But if you have non-normalized samples, why would you normalize each individual hit rather than look at, say, the entire group of snare drum samples, find the loudest one, which is probably still not normalized, normalize each sample by the amount that the loudest sample needs to hit maximum, because then you have the, the natural velocity curve that the drummer ac actually produced, which would be perfectly natural and pleasant, rather than recreating something that you lost during the normalization process. Yeah, you said that this is actually what drum gizmo does normally, um, although we do not normalize in the first place. But we use uh, the natural way of you can say velocity translation from the physical motion of the drummer. So the soft hits would be an actual soft hit on the snare drum okay. recorded. And it is not loud because he didn't hit it very hard. That's how drum gizmo works. But, but when I'm talking about normalization now is because you might have a sample set that was already recorded. You didn't make it yourself. You got it from somewhere. So, and you don't know the sampling sorting. You don't know which, maps, which samples map to which velocity areas. Then you need to fix this somehow. And simply normalizing them would fix this, because then we'll, it would apply the normalization as a gain level afterwards. OK? And, and normalizing them individually, don't do this. <laughs> that was basically my point. Um, that was it. Thank you <laughs> for listening. And I hope I didn't scare you too much, because drum gizmo isn't really that hard to use, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it might seem like this. Here are questions. Yeah, one, questions. Uh, first one from IRC. Mm -hmm. um, I just read it out loud. In the snare demo just now, um, he, so you, did not have left-right hand samples available, right? It still sounds somewhat robotic. That is just the chat line. Yeah, I did not get the question. What's the question, question? Is, the question is, these were not, the, the um, salamander samples are not left, left and right hand. No, I don't think so. Okay. I think that's just confirmation. Yeah. Okay. But, I, but personally, I didn't think they sounded robotic, but that's just a matter of opinion. <laughs> then, um, <laughs> I, I d yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we did, I did turn off the humanizer, so if you turn on the humanizer, it will sound more natural, I think. Okay. And a question from me. Um, you have this. Um, you have the drum gizmo editor, and I remember plenty of times you showed that you can import samples, and it will sort them by velocity, yes. or, by, or by power level, what, uh, whatever the right term is. So if you don't know, um, if you get some some samples from the internet and you don't know the velocity because the file names are just one, two, three, four, um, you already have an algorithm in your editor, right? To to sort them by, by velocity. Yes, but the editor needs a lot of extra information. It needs to know the, which channels are mapped to what uh, instrument, so it can know the master channel of the instrument to measure the power. This is the same problem as we have, we have with the normalization. In the editor, we just do it automatically. Um, and also, if you import them into the editor, what you would get would just be one hit. But theoretically, there's no problem in concatenating all the samples in the same order in multiple files, imported them back into the editor as if a drummer has been hitting the snare 32 times uh, as one long take, and then using the editor to recut the samples and calculate the power levels. That would be possible. I have never done it, because I think it would be a bit of a tedious work. But you could do it, I think. Yes? Uh, right. A question about the, the humanizer. Uh, so. I understand how the velocity humanizer works. Uh, so, how about the timing humanizer? Because uh, in in a plugin, you can actually only delay, uh, but you cannot. Uh, do you have some kind of l look ahead? Uh, yeah, we, we 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 sort of invented a time machine. Uh, let me show you. No, I'm just kidding. We um, we introduced a delay in in the plugin. So, whenever you enable the the timing humanizer, it will add a delay of. 
I think, okay. 500 milliseconds. And this is, the, this is exactly to be able to move the nodes backwards in time. Um, so you, 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 uh, you signal a delay of 500 milliseconds and then... Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I think it is actually. I, don't, I can't remember the number anymore. It could be 250 milliseconds. It's quite a lot because we want to be able to drift a lot backwards. But still, it's, it, it, does, it doesn't work if it's, if it's a live, if it's a live MIDI signal. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I click this, um, of course you cannot. <laughs> uh, do we have audio? Okay, now I'll, I'll drop my finger when I click the mouse, so you can see the delay. Oh, now I moved it. That was not intentional. So, I think 250 milliseconds, not, not that far off. Um, but of course, when I play it, it will be compensated, so it will be on time. But if you use drum gizmo with a real drum kit, you certainly want to disable this, because this will be very frustrating. But just to, now that I already have it open, and we have some more time left, how much time do we have? OK. Um, let me just enable this, and we make it pretty Light, not not tight, and now I'll play. Let's make it even less tight. Yeah, that that was really natural, right? Yeah, <laughs> and if you also add the humanization velocity. Yeah, that sounds like me on a Saturday morning, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so that was it. Any more questions? Yeah, one, one question. Uh, for example, when you have uh, a sample set that you really like, but it has only like mono channels, and it's, I don't know, it might, might be mixed up in a, in a good way, but you want to uh, use this opportunity of drum gizmo that you can have multi-channel microphone Setups. Do you see a possibility of, uh, I don't know, like using other plugins in combination to get a multi-channel microphone uh, situation out of a sample set that is not recorded multi-channel? Well, you could use some room emulation, for example. Um, I think some um, convolution plugins could help out in this area, but I don't know if the uh, convolution uh, filter responses would be easy to find. Maybe Jan has a, yeah. I think you need the microphone. <laughs> Sorry. It's kind of ridiculous, but it would be fun. Like if you have your own recording lab with the 16 microphones, you just take out the drums, and then in place of each instrument, play, put a measurement loudspeaker, like a studio monitor, mm -hmm. and play a sweep. And then do the inverse convolution into all 16 channels. And then you have the room response and the clean bleed. And then if you plug in, in instead of, the, instead of the, the, the impulse that you get, you just convolve that with the actual mono signal, you get 16 channels with bleed and with room response. Yeah, and but then but it then would you would be hilarious to do yeah, that. But you would only get the response from the walls and the uh, response or the coloring of the microphones. You don't get the resonation, the, exactly. the, the resonance yeah. of the other drums. So if so you want that, well, that's easy to do. But then, of course, you get the resonances of your drum kit, not of the one that's measured. But you could just yes. only take out one instrument at a time and leave the others to resonate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And of course, you can also do that n times with n available drum kits, right? It can yeah. be arbitrarily like hilarious, but it's in, it's, yeah, yeah, it should yeah. be possible but and I, not I, too I, hard. But I thought exactly about what you yeah. just described <laughs> because you already you already have the drum kit, and then you found out, damn, I forgot the cowbell. <laughs> 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 so we should put impulse responses and then emulate the rest of the drum kit, and you can hit the cowbell. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, that's a closing note, or. <laughs> uh, I see no more questions, no, none in the chat, so... Great. 
Thank you for, for not leaving. 